Hi friends, I bring out another interesting topic today, diastolic dysfunction, often referred to as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Over the last several years and decades, we've concentrated a lot on left ventricular systolic function. However, in the last seven to 10 years, diastolic dysfunction or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has now been increasingly recognized as an important problem. In fact, for years, we, we ignored it as a problem of the old. But now, as I said, almost literature reports around 30 to 50 percent of the patients who come in with heart failure in the hospital actually may have a diastolic dysfunction. And of course, there could be an overlap. You may have a reduced ejection fraction as well as a diastolic dysfunction, or you may have a predominant diastolic dysfunction as an independent problem presenting as heart failure. Now, we, for, for us to understand diastolic dysfunction, obviously, you need to understand when is the diastole happening. So is it happening at any time? Of course not. It happens after every systole and before the next systole happens, we have a phase of diastole. And what is that phase of diastole? I'm just going to show you on this graph here. If this uptick in the pressure gray wave as, as, as compared to the ECG is your systole, this yellow line here, which is sort of going up and showing you the changes in the pressure is actually your diastole. So between the two systole, you can see the diastole. Well, it's not rocket science, but I'm going to take this a little bit more into detail for all of us to understand that what is happening in that phase of diastole. So in that phase of diastole, we know there are four phases of left ventricular diastole. First is your isovolumetric relaxation time, which is your isovolumetric relaxation as the, as the systole is over, your aortic valve closes, mitral valve opens, starts to open up and the ventricle, left ventricle starts to relax, which is your isovolumetric relaxation there. You can see that there's no flow happening at that time. But as soon as the ventricle is relaxed, you have a rapid filling from the left atrium into the left ventricle because the left ventricular pressure was low, left ventricle volume was low because we had just finished the systole there. Left ventricle was empty, where the left atria had the blood in it, which was supposed to come into the left ventricle as soon as the diastole begins. As soon as the mitral valve opens up, you have a rapid filling of around two thirds of the blood volume, which is present in the left atria, which will come into the left ventricle. And then the pressures would equalize and you have a phase of diastasis. This is your phase of diastasis. Now you can see that the pressures have equalized. However, now the atria still has around two thirds of blood or around 25, 30% of the blood to remaining. And that's when the atrial contraction kicks in and rest of the blood flows into the left ventricle. Now, how do you actually take this into, into a context of more graphics? If you just concentrate onto the red box there, you can understand that the ventricles, when they become stiff, they take less and less blood in them. Whereas the, the graph, the picture on the left of your of my screen, which is a normal heart, will show you that the heart is able to accommodate reasonable amount of blood coming and being pushed out if both the functions of the left and right ventricle are normal. Whereas when you have a reduced ejection fraction, your heart starts to balloon up. And of course, as I mentioned before as well, you could have overlap or you could have strictly one over the other as well. So all the combinations are possible. Now, how do you diagnose heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Well, the best way to do that at the bedside in ICU is two-dimensional echocardiography, and transthoracic way is the look is the way to go. However, I am going to talk to you about the two commonly used modalities, which is mitral valve Doppler pulse wave use and a Doppler tissue imaging or a DTI or a tissue Doppler imaging, what we call it. So I'm just going to sort of concentrate on the mitral valve area, which seems to be the most easiest for us to do an assessment of the diastolic function at the bedside. So let's understand what is normal Doppler of the mitral valve inflow. You can see in the picture here, I place the Doppler just above the mitral valve inflow. Now, whatever is the blood which is flowing from the atria into the ventricle, I will be able to measure that and understand the flow using the Doppler wave. So I put in the pulse Doppler there, and what you can see is a phase of uh, phase of isovolumetric relaxation, followed by a rapid filling phase, which gives rise to this big uptick in the pulse in the pulse wave Doppler. You can see that E wave coming up. Then, as the E wave decelerates down, you have a phase of diastasis where the patients have equalized and there is no flow happening. And then, as the atria contracts, you generate an A wave as well. Normally, you will have E wave, which will be around twice the size of A wave. So you have one milliseconds over 0.6. So EA ratio is around one is to two. Deceleration time and also volumetric relaxation time around 200 milliseconds and around 70 milliseconds. So deceleration time is the time it takes to decelerate from the peak to the bottom. And that's around 200 milliseconds and IVRT is around 70 milliseconds. Now let's understand a disease problem. So when your heart is relaxing slowly, 
there is a phase or a stage one diastolic dysfunction, what we call it as an abnormal relaxation. So the ventricle has still not relaxed completely, but the heart has gone into a diastole already. So what will happen? Ventricle is not able to accommodate the entire blood. So when that flow happens here, you can see that the E wave, which should have been ideally taller, is actually smaller. And then it also decelerates very, very rapidly. And the isovolumetric relaxation time between your A wave and the E wave is also becoming shorter and shorter now. Now what happens is that when the, when the E wave finishes off and a phase of diastasis, a small phase of diastasis happens, there is still enough blood with pressure remaining in the left atrium. So when the atrial contraction happens, there's a bigger uptick in the Doppler waveform, which you can see as an A wave here. So your E wave now has become shorter, A wave has become taller. Obviously, the ratios have reversed, so E upon A ratio goes down. Your deceleration time and your isovolumetric relaxation time, obviously, because it's slowly con relaxing now, your IVRT becomes, becomes slower and slower, so it becomes longer. If I was to put these same things in the word, the normal crossover between the left atrium and the left ventricular pressure is decreased. Hence, there is a reduction in the E wave velocity. There is a prolongation of the isovolumetric relaxation time and deceleration time. And obviously, the A wave velocity increases. So, there is an EA reversal. Now, imagine the heart becoming more and more stiffer. With this, we did not have a pressure problem because the pressure was still okay. This is early stage. But as we start seeing more and more problems, you start seeing a phase called as pseudo-normalization. Now, pseudo-normalization, as the name suggests, you have exactly the same appearance of an E wave being taller and an A wave being shorter. Okay, so E upon A wave is, is, is maintained, but you may not have double the size of E wave. The E wave may still be less than double of the size of E wave. Plus, you can see that rest of the things may completely appear normal. Deceleration time, isovolumetric relaxation time may not actually have any difference. But the moment you do a Valsalva for these patients, you will see a complete reversal of E and A wave, E wave going down and the A wave going up. That's your pseudo-normal pattern being deciphered by you by asking the patient to do a Valsalva maneuver. If the patient is ventilated, you could also do a big sigh breath and get a similar kind of a picture which would be like a Valsalva maneuver or a big breath, big tidal volume for one tidal volume we could give and you could do this assessment. And if you have an EA reversal, you know that you are in pseudo-normal pattern. Again, if I put the same thing in the words, what is happening is the ventricle is becoming more and more stiffer and there is now a pressure problem. So this transition is seen in cardiac diseases. It's a phase between abnormal relaxation and the severe form, which is a restrictive pattern. This is almost called as a stage two diastolic dysfunction. Um, it could be because of uh, the decrease in the left ventricular compliance now in conjunction with the moderate increase in left, vent left atrial pressure. So this causes the E velocity to go up. So it's actually the pressure and the compliance which causes the E velocity to go up. Though the filling may actually appear normal, there is a significant abnormality which is present. And then as the heart becomes more and more stiffer, you go into a restrictive pattern. The left ventricle is stiff. The compliance is absolutely poor. The pressures in the left atrium are very, very high. So as soon as the diastole happens there, you have a large E wave, which is very, very high, two or three times the normal size of an E wave, followed by a small A wave. We can see the small A wave here, which is coming up. So the E upon A ratio almost becomes two times or maybe even three times. The deceleration time is very, very rapid and the isovolumetric relaxation time has gone extremely low. This is a restrictive pattern. Now, as you can understand, this pattern is fairly dependent on the regular rhythm. Any of these Doppler measurements would require a little bit of understanding to decipher it, whether it is pseudo-normal or normal. Restrictive would probably be self-explanatory. My normal would sort of probably be self-explanatory as well. However, what we can do is uh, we can go back and we can have a look at tissue Doppler imaging. Before that, I just want to complete this. If I was to put this into words, there's a high left atrial pressure which increases the E wave velocity. There's a very short IVRT resulting in rapid equalization of the left atrial and left ventricular pressure. And thus, there is a short uh, deceleration time as well. And all this has happened because of significant reduction in the compliance of the left ventricle. Now, for this to be more 
firm about your diagnosis. You could do is you could record systolic and diastolic Doppler velocities within the myocardium or on the corner of the mitral annulus. And these velocities can be ranged, can, can range between 0.2 to 40 centimeters per second. So you've got a wide range to look at these velocities. And they will make you understand better what a normal or a pseudo-normal or a restrictive pattern is. So if I was to put my tissue Doppler imaging and I get a E dash and an A dash, which is a mirror image of an E and A wave, and I get those images, I am now confirming that my E A, a reversal was there plus E upon E dash and A dash reversal is also seen on my tissue Doppler imaging. How is it done? I put in my, my cursor on the mitral valve annulus and I press my tissue Doppler imaging mode and then I press my Doppler and I will get this inverted image here below my baseline and the velocities will be fairly low. If you see the V-wave velocity is 0 .0 sec 0.07 sec milliseconds and the A-wave is 0 0.09 milliseconds. So A-wave is obviously bigger. We call this as A prime or A dash, E prime or E dash. So E and A velocities are reversed here. So this confirms abnormal relaxation. Similarly, pseudo normalization. What would happen is in a pseudo normalization, you would have a normal E wave and a normal looking A wave. Here you still have a smaller E dash and a bigger A prime or A dash. So you actually have a, a pattern which you would have normally had to do Valsalva maneuver. Here you can see that the velocities are reversed and you can see a bigger velocity here for the E and A. And that's what actually diagnosed you, the, the tissue Doppler imaging would diagnose pseudo normalization fairly well. In a restrictive pattern, no prices for getting, your E prime will be, will be much, much more bigger as compared to your A prime. And it would actually match quite nicely with your, uh, with your diagnosis on a tissue Doppler imaging as well as on your mitral valve inflow imaging. Now, if I was to put this all into a perspective, forget about the ECG. You look at the mitral valve inflow, E and A, the restrictive pattern, the pseudo-normal pattern. And you can see that when I come to my tissue Doppler imaging, my E prime and A prime matches in normal. My E prime and A prime matches in my so in my first stage one diastolic dysfunction, which is, uh, which is uh, fairly easy, which is EA reversal here. But in my pseudo normal pattern, my E wave is taller than A wave here, but my E prime is shorter than my A prime here, which diagnoses stage two diastolic dysfunction quite well. And as I said, restrictive pattern is fairly easy. Your E wave is taller, your, uh, e, your E prime is also taller out here. And you can see those patterns very, very well out there to be done. So with this guys, I think we can come up with some filling pressures here. So if your E upon E prime ratio is more than 15, you could say that there is a good chance that this patient is adequately filled, more than adequately filled, and there are increased filling pressures. But if your E upon E prime ratio is less than 8, it's got normal filling pressures. So I believe that this is a very reasonable way of diagnosing diastolic dysfunction, and you can understand it quite well. So in summary, never decide on left ventricular function in one view. You can use MAPSI and TAPSI to look at the functions a little bit more. But uh, I think never forget the diastolic dysfunction is what the message I want to give. Thank you very much.